the revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Comrades, and welcome to today's O'Malley Taught Me Sunday study featuring Chairman O'Malley Ishitella. My name is Akile Anai, the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Make sure to hit that like button and share this video on the platform that you're viewing from. This week, Chairman O'Malley Ishitella continues a study on dialectical materialism. He will read from Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth, starting on page 22 with the subhead. The Basic Teachings of Materialism in Opposition to Idealism. The study materials have been linked in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions for your benefit. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials, and in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. It's my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shatella. Uhuru. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Director Akile, uh, for the introduction. I want to welcome everybody to uh, the study on today. Uh, we've been uh, looking at this issue, uh, this study uh, on materialism and dialectic method. We've used uh, Maurice Cornforth's book by that title uh, as the basis uh, for this discussion. In many ways, we've treated it as a foil uh, to really dig into the question of dialectic historical materialism. Uh, having used the method of, uh, of, of, uh, of investigation and analysis uh, uh, to actually uh, to cre critique reality. And it's brought us to some different conclusions that, uh, of the, than those of, uh, of Cornforth, Maurice Cornforth and, and, and Karl Marx, uh, uh, as, as Cornforth himself was a Marxist. This was not done with the intention of uh, dismissing uh, Marx or anything like that. I know there are various uh, uh, nationalists uh, uh, who uh, dismiss uh, Marx, uh, characterizing him as just being a white man or, or uh, his conclusions as just something coming from the white man. And in many instances, this is a need to uh, assault uh, the, the whole issue of uh, working class people coming to power more than anything else. Uh, and although sometimes it is a reflection of a certain kind of uh, philosophy that exists within our community. Our purpose for looking at this is uh, because we accept the validity of uh, a historical materialist or a dialectical materialist uh, investigation and analysis. Uh, 
<clears throat> to uh, look at uh, at society. And when looking applied to investigation society, dialectical materialism is referred to as historical materialism. So generally speaking, we unite with that, uh, though we don't unite with the conclusions that uh, have been come to uh, by by uh, many of the conclusions by Marx and 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 people who uh, profess to be followers of of Marx. I do want to say that it is extremely important for people who are participating in this study. I'm speaking specifically or, or particularly to people who are members of the African People's Socialist Party or of the Uhuru movement to read this material. I, I think it is serious uh, for and, and important for us to come into the study, uh, having read it and then you know, even after the study to read it. I also want to say that uh, uh, almost everything that I've written uh, that you've uh, uh, looked at uh, various political reports uh, are based on uh, historical materialist investigation, dialectics of uh, <clears throat> uh, materialism applied to the investigation society. And of course, when we apply to the investigation society, we are, are moving from uh, the standpoint of uh, the uh, relationship that Africa and African people have uh, to uh, the existing uh, and, and dominant, uh, uh, even if on a shaky foundation, uh, social system uh, that came in uh, to being uh, through its relationship uh, to Africa and African people. We use this uh, uh, to uh, investigate uh, and uh, our place and destiny in the world to come to certain conclusions around that. And that's where we emerge with the uh, philosophy of African internationalism. So please look at this, read this, go look at the, the I'm hoping this will help us to look at the various political reports uh, that I have put forth uh, with a different eye. And uh, we, we did something, I think, 40 years ago this year, I think it was in 1991, uh, the, uh, uh, for 30 years, what, 91? Well, 30, 40 years ago, uh, uh, the dialectics of the Black Revolution. Uh, and I only looked at that, I was glanced at that last night. Uh, it, uh, but I want to go ahead and, and begin this. And one reason I think it's important for you uh, to look at this, to read it, is because it, may, it will make it unnecessary for me uh, to, to start up recapping uh, everything or much of what's been said about the study uh, up to this point. And I can go right into uh, the study, looking at Cornforth and what he's had to say, and then uh, uh, and hoping uh, that we can uh, grasp uh, uh, the whole issue uh, of an understanding of dialectical and historical materialism. So we're on page 22, the subhead, uh, the basic teachings of material, materialism in opposition to idealism. In opposition to all forms of idealism and, and of tricky compromises between materialism and idealism, the basic teachings of materialism can be formulated very simply and clearly. To grasp the essence of these teachings, we should also understand what are the main assertions made in every form of idealism. There are three such main assertions of idealism. One, idealism asserts that the material world is dependent on the spiritual. Idealism, two, idealism asserts that spirit or mind or idea can and does exist in separation from matter. And the most extreme form of this assertion is subjective idealism which asserts that matter does not exist at all, but is pure illusion. And three, idealism asserts that there exists a realm of the mysterious and unknowable above or beyond or behind what can be ascertained and known by perception, experience, and science. The basic teachings of materialism stand in opposition to these three assertions of idealism. One, materialism teaches that the world is by its very nature material that everything which exists comes into being on the basis of material causes, arises and develops in accordance with the laws of motion of matter. matter. Two, materialism teaches that matter is objective reality existing outside and independent of the mind, and that far from the mental existing in separation from the material, everything mental or spiritual is a product of material processes. Three, 
Materialism teaches that the world and its laws are fully knowable, and that while much may not be known, there is nothing which is by nature unknowable. I mean, this uh, uh, coin for says that a Marxist Leninist a philosophy is characterized by its absolutely consistent materialism all along the line. We, we say that about uh, African internationalism uh, by its making no concessions, whatever, at any point to idealism. Thus, Stalin points out a contrary to idealism, which regards the world as the embodiment of an absolute idea, a universal spirit, con spirit consciousness, Marx philosophical materialism holds that the world is by its very nature material, that the multifold phenomena of the world can constitute different forms of matter in motion, and that the world develops in accordance with the laws of movement of matter with, and stands in no need of universal spirit. B, contrary to idealism, which asserts that, our, or that only our mind really exists, the Marxist materialist philosophy holds that matter nature being is an objective reality existing outside and independent of our mind, that matter is primary, since it is the source of sensations, ideas, mind, and that mind is secondary, derivative, since it is a reflection of matter, a reflection of being, that thought is a product of matter, which in its development has reached a high degree of perfection, namely of the brain. And the brain is the organ of thought. And therefore, and that therefore, one cannot separate thought from matter without committing a grave error. C, contrary to idealism, which denies the possibility of knowing the world and its laws, a Marxist philosophical materialism holds that the world and its laws are fully knowable, that our knowledge of the laws of nature tested by experiment and practice is authentic knowledge having the validity of objective truth and that there are no things in the world which are unknowable, but only things which are still not known, but which will be disclosed and made known by the efforts of science and practice. So this is a, this is a quote from Stalin uh, on this uh, issue of materialism. And I, I, I think the basic uh, uh, understanding of materialism uh, can be uh, discerned uh, from what we have said here. I don't think we have a fundamental argument there. Materialism and idealism in, in, in practice, as was pointed out below, above, uh, the opposition of materialism and idealism, which has now uh, been stated in its most general terms, is not an opposition between abstract theories of the nature of the world, but is an opposition between different ways of understanding and interpreting every question. This is why it is of, of such profound importance. Let us, and I, I want to say that that uh, I, we take it for granted, you know, like uh, how we see and understand everything. But the reality is that uh, our worldview of uh, philosophy plays a profound role in that. And what we see uh, often uh, uh, is is uh, mis uh, misunderstood. Uh, 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 and for example, I've used the example, uh, I've used this before, uh, that, and it seems rather obvious to, you know, and I think if, depending on your worldview, uh, it will uh, seem uh, obvious to most people, but uh, I, I like, I've used the example of in Miami, uh, because it was so glaring to me, uh, that uh, we see, uh, uh, you, you go into Miami and, and uh, Africans will tell you that the Black people live over this side, and then the Haitians live over on this side. And it's extraordinary because uh, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other unless, uh, uh, unless the person opened, uh, opened their mouth and said something. And, and, and uh, so we've been so, uh, uh, we've come to conclusions that are based on an interpretation uh, and analysis of uh, imperialism that separated us. It serves the purpose of imperialism and not us so that even uh, uh, what we see and experience by our senses can be denied uh, just because uh, uh, our worldview uh, is so affected uh, and infected uh, by the worldview of the, of the ruling class. Idealists, uh, let us consider some, some of the very practical ways in which the opposition of materialism and idealism is manifested. And uh, I just did that. But idealists tells us, tell us, for example, not to place too much reliance on science. They tell us that the most important truths are beyond the reach of, of science. Hence, 
They encourage us not to believe things on the basis of evidence, experience, practice, but to take them on trust from those who pretend to know best and to have some higher source of information. And this is idealism. And I, I mentioned this in terms of, uh, of how to recognize the significance of uh, this of, uh, worldview and practice. And, and uh, it was on just yesterday, uh, members of, the, of our party and, and movement attended a meeting uh, in St. Louis. And uh, in the middle of this meeting, uh, we uh, discussing how uh, the treacherous African petty bourgeoisie in government uh, here in St. Louis, majority African city that uh, that uh, uh, white power, the colonizer, is uh, busily trying to uh, change to 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 minimize uh, to push out the African population, and they're doing this through uh, uh, various uh, uh, mechanisms, and one of which uh, that they are using is to take any any semblance of power or most semblance of power away from the African population uh, by changing uh, the structure of the uh, uh, the 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 government, so that where today uh, there are uh, something like uh, 28 um, uh, different wards uh, that will elect uh, older persons, uh, they have changed that so that now they are 14. Cut it in half, and cutting it in half uh, has the uh, uh, the result of that is to make it extraordinarily difficult for Africans who now spread out. Uh, wide, more widely, uh, uh, who uh, would have to spend more money uh, to run for office because they are spread out, which means that uh, you will have a situation where the uh, the colonial capitalists will be making all the difference just in terms of paying off and paying for campaigns of people, Africans who are closer to their politics. Uh, uh, these are some of the issues uh, and it's a matter of uh, just uh, diluting the power and ability of Black people to have power. And so uh, the African petty bourgeoisie, uh, most of it uh, that's in power today in government, uh, have played a role uh, in allowing this to happen. And the, the arguments that, that, that we ran into in the meeting before this was being discussed on yesterday, the outcome is that uh, uh, one, uh, when we uh, made our presentations about what it meant that the, what the what the colonizers were doing, the people were, yeah, yeah, that's right. We agree with everything that you said on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, they uh, uh, when it, when it came to fighting against the uh, uh, sectors of the African petty bourgeoisie and neo-colonial forces uh, who worked hand in glove with the realtors and and things like and forces like that who are taking our properties. Uh, the politicians, the elected officials are saying stuff, well, you know, yep, that's, that's, that's true, everything that's being said uh, by, by us, by, by members of the party and the Huru movement, but this is where we are now, this is what we have to accept uh, what, what, what uh, we are faced with, because if we don't uh, go ahead and accept this, then the colonizers are going to uh, turn it over to outsiders to make the decisions for us, and that's going to work against us. Of course, uh, they, they fail to mention the obvious that the reason they're having this discussion in the first place is because outsiders have already uh, made determinations. And so we have all these Africans who on the one hand agree with everything that we say because they can see the consequence. They see Africans have been kicked out of the homes, the power of eminent domain taken entire communities. and and destroying them, turning them over uh, to uh, the Defense Department, to uh, uh, creating uh, things like uh, more than a thousand uh, acres of the land, new power of eminent domain taken from African people, hundreds of families uh, kicked out so that they can uh, initiate a, uh, a national geospatial intelligence uh, agency in the middle of the African community. And then uh, all these uh, white so-called investors uh, and realtors who are just taking all of, all of the property in the African community, that's the outsiders. They've already done this. Uh, but uh, the fact is that when we challenge the African petty bourgeoisie, uh, the neo-colonialists were playing a role in this for not fighting, for not uh, representing the interests of the working class. There are sectors of the working class themselves who will say that, yeah, we agree with everything that you said about this is the reality, but don't say anything bad about uh, about uh, the, 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 the older person. 
uh, that the, all the person is just really working for us. And there's an assumption that they, they know uh, uh, things that, uh, and, and have uh, explanations and they know best and have some higher source of information. That's the form of idealism. So we go to Cornforth and he says, in this way, idealism is a very good friend and standby of every form of reactionary propaganda. It is the philosophy of the capitalist press and the radio. It favors superstitions of all sorts, prevents us from thinking for ourselves and taking a scientific approach to moral and social problems. And if you think about it, when you go through the checkout lines uh, in some places, uh, uh, countries in the world, uh, uh, and some uh, uh, imperialist uh, countries in the world, you go through the checkout line and, and you see uh, all kinds of publications for sale. And the objective is to win people to, uh, who uh, to, to make uh, spontaneous purchases. And they have uh, magazines and newspapers, you know, with uh, uh, that promote uh, uh, nonsense like a goat discovered on the moon uh, with two heads or Elvis maybe alive someplace and stuff that just is so far-fetched that take people away from uh, any uh, relationship to the real world. Idealism is just fair to the masses of the people all the time. I've worked in certain cities, uh, including St. Louis, uh, where it is difficult even to find a regular bourgeois newspaper, where you can't find the New York Times or that the bourgeoisie reads uh, for and understand. You can't find uh, the Wall Street Journal unless you go to certain select places outside of the community, but you can find plenty of the nonsensical uh, kinds of publication that they feed us all the time. You will not find uh, 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 in uh, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, uh, these, uh, uh, what do they call them, where uh, um, they, they, they have this astrology, you know, uh, things about reading, you, you know, your, your, uh, your, your astrological, uh, 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 some kinds of astrological determinations. You, you know, uh, what's your sign kind of stuff that you see here so uh, pronounced in the African community? I'm a Libra, I'm a this and a that. You won't find that in the Wall Street Journal. You won't find that in the New York Times. You won't find that in any serious uh, publication that's educating the bourgeoisie or people close to the bourgeoisie so that they understand the real world. So this is how, on a regular basis, uh, the masses of people, the African people, oppressed people, are fed uh, spurious uh, uh, philosophical idealist uh, conception, concepts and, and a perception of the world. It's obscurantism, obscures reality. So again, uh, uh, looking at uh, 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 forth. Uh, so in this way, idealism is a very good friend and standby of every form of reactionary propaganda. It is the philosophy of the capitalist press and radio. It favors superstitions of all sorts, prevents us from thinking for ourselves and taking a scientific approach to moral and social problems. Again, idealists teach us, tell us uh, that what is most important for us uh, all is the inner life of the soul. And you hear that stuff all the time uh, in the African community. If they don't say the inner life of the soul, uh, they tell us it's about Jesus, uh, some other, uh, even depending on some communities like uh, in, in St. Louis, uh, it's uh, 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 Allah or uh, Islam, uh, et cetera. They tell us what that we shall never solve our human problems except by some energy regeneration. Uh, and this is a favorite theme in the speech of well-fed persons. Uh, but many workers fall for it too. In factories, for example, and he uses this thing about in the second imperialist war, where this more rearmament group is active. They tell you to fight. They tell you not to fight for better conditions, but to improve your soul. They do not tell you that the best way to improve yourself materially and morally is to join the fight for peace and socialism. This is Cornforth's perspective on peace and socialism, doing, uh, uh, dealing with the contest between the Soviet Union, to which he was loyal uh, uh, as, as a Marxist, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the imperialist forces of the so-called West. But you know, uh, I think about the, the Million Man March, uh, well, uh, more than a million, maybe as many as two million African people uh, descended uh, on Washington, D.C. 
And uh, the basic premise of the march was uh, somehow uh, that African people ourselves had to uh, atone. So here we are, the victims of empire. We had to atone. And it was uh, much of it uh, had nothing. You got two million people maybe there. there. There's nothing that sums up the contradiction, the oppression of our people. Instead, it's a, a, improving your soul, yourself. Uh, and so don't use the B word and don't do this and that. And many Africans left there really thrilled. Uh, and and uh, especially the African petty bourgeoisie and others, you know, because so many African people came together in and of itself. That was a very powerful uh, kind of mobilization. But this whole notion, uh, my mother, uh, uh, who was in her 80s at the time, uh, she said to me something about why would it be important for African people to go to Washington, D.C., uh, to atone, uh, if anything, uh, then it would be uh, necessary for the for the uh, colonial capitalists to atone. And if you, it's a matter of atoning, you can go uh, right to your local community to do that. But the, in, instead of looking to fight against the system, uh, we fight for some moral imperfection of ourselves. And this feeds right into uh, the philosophy of the colonial capitalist bourgeoisie who tells us over and over, and over again that the reason we catch so much hell is because something is wrong with us because we are broken uh, in some ways uh, because there is uh, some kind of pathology uh, of the African community that makes us do bad things because uh, babies are having babies and, and all kinds of nonsense like that. So uh, again, uh, with Corn Force, Again, uh, an idealist approach is, is common among many socialists. Many sincere socialists, for example, think that what is essentially wrong with capitalism is that goods are unfairly distributed. And that if only we could get anyone, including the capitalists, to accept the new conception of fairness and justice, then we could uh, do away with the evils of capitalism. Socialism to them is nothing but the realization of an abstract idea of justice. And this is what we find that has emerged today that in the name of socialism, when we see the so-called democratic socialists, we see uh, Bernie Sanders who was running uh, for president. That's his uh, idea, his, his idea of, uh, of socialism. Their idea of socialism does not put socialism uh, as uh, 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 something that is in an existential uh, uh, struggle uh, with uh, capitalism, that capitalism has to be overthrown. And then beyond that, uh, we hear the issue that the problem that African people suffer is because of racism, the ideas that's in the hand, heads of, of white people. And then the final analysis, that drops the responsibility of change on the African people because what our responsibility now becomes is not throwing uh, to overturn the social system itself, uh, but to uh, make uh, white people like us, as I say, to struggle against racism, to struggle against the bad ideas that they have about us. This becomes a uh, profound uh, uh, responsibility based on this idealistic approach uh, to reality that we are constantly confronted with, which makes it necessary for us to even contest and contend with corn force and Marx in terms of how they interpret uh, the world, how they investigate and interpret the world, not just interpret how they investigate, what it is that they look at to come to conclusions that they, they come to. And uh, when we look at Corn Forth here, it's talked about socialism to them is nothing but the realization of an abstract idea of justice, talking about folk who we would call utopians, utopianist socialists or uh, folk who now characterize themselves as democratic socialists uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, this, 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 the worldview of a, of a, of a, of a corn forth and many people who characterize themselves as scientific socialism uh, facilitate the ongoing existence of, of capitalism, of the social system, uh, by somehow uh, saying that the way African people uh, resolve our contradictions uh, is uh, by recognizing that what happens to us uh, 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 is uh, uh, in terms of what they characterize as racism, the colonial uh, uh, tax that per per permeates our existence uh, is uh, makes it necessary for us to go and fight uh, 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 
for 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 against capitalism. That somehow, if you fight against capitalism, and that's turned things vast backwards, because the reality is that capitalism itself, as our investigation tells us, uh, it rests on a foundation of colonialism. It's the colonial question that gets obscured. And so you hear, uh, you can hear coming from Marx and coming from Cornforth, uh, what have you, an idealism uh, in terms of the assumption of the basis of the oppression, not only affecting African and colonized peoples of, uh, uh, around the world, but the very foundation of the capitalism that they say they hate so much, they can't even get to it because philosophical idealism that has convinced them uh, about uh, who we are as African people who, um, what Europe and who Europeans are, uh, that has uh, uh, distorted their ability to even see the world, uh, let alone uh, uh, investigate the world uh, uh, and come to decent uh, and uh, revolutionary conclusions. So anyway, when we look at uh, what Cornforth is saying, we're on page 24, uh, and he's uh, uh, criticizing this, this approach uh, about uh, you know the problem with uh, how idealism uh, approach various uh, questions uh, <clears throat> and uh, the notion that somehow the problem with capitalism is that goods are unfairly distributed uh, and that just uh, you know uh, just get the you know the capitalist to to accept the new conception of fairness uh, and that's what it's all about. I work with people uh, in meetings that who uh, uh, would scream uh, bloody murder if we said that's what you are that's the thing you represent this whole notion that somehow what we're doing is critiquing and criticizing capitalism and uh, somehow by so doing and telling the capitalists that you're doing so you're naughty you're doing all these bad things etc this is the best solution that we we convince the capitalists uh, to change uh, their ways and make things better uh, for black people and much of the struggle around African people revolves around this question is uh, uh, as if we just uh, uh, educate and help uh, uh, the capitalists understand things better and all the people around the capitalists then they would change stuff. It presupposes that there is no need for revolution uh, to overturn the actual objective material conditions that we suffer from. And uh, this, uh, in many ways, is the, is the essence of what philosophical idealism is. So we say the idealism of this belief, this is calling for, lies in its assumption that it is simply the ideas which we hold that, that determine the way we live and the way society is organized. Those who think in this way forget to look for the material causes for what in fact determines the way goods are distributed in capitalist society. The wealth enjoyed by one part of society while the other and greater part lives in poverty is not the ideas which men hold about the distribution of wealth, but the material fact that the mode of production rests on the exploitation of the worker by the capitalist. And I just wanna say something here because as uh, I, I think uh, uh, it takes us in the uh, terrain of of a really uh, important thing is uh, because of what the Marxists and, and Cornforth uh, uh, have never understood and what African internationalism teaches us is that uh, when you talk about uh, a mode of production uh, that rests on the exploitation of the work about the capitalists, the fact is that there's a mode of production that preceded uh, what they call capitalism that is the basis for capitalism that that followed uh, what is characterized as the feudal mode of production that existed in Europe. And what we're saying is that colonialism itself uh, was a mode of production. And this is fundamentally important because what colonialism did uh, and that Marx referred to as primitive accumulation of capital, it united the entire world uh, into a common economy. It was born, uh, this thing that's called capitalism was born as a world system globally existent. And it was colonialism that pulled the whole world together, created a whole new world economy. And this new world economy was defined by the dialectic uh, between the colonizer and the colonized. This is the profound uh, relationship. This is the thing, the unity of opposites that define this mode of production, the colonizer versus the capital uh, versus the colonized. And, and the problem here is that now you have a one uh, a social system, not just a lot of different social systems coexisting. You don't just have the capitalists who are doing things uh, in isolation and uh, uh, from the 
colonized who just comes up with a policy of oppression exploitation. It's like uh, uh, an example I've used because it's something I know how to do uh, is uh, somebody, you know, like cooking uh, biscuits, et cetera. Uh, because uh, when you got uh, salt, uh, that's just one thing uh, that would go uh, into making a biscuit. When you've got the, uh, the, the, the almond milk or, or whatever else uh, that substitutes you put in there, that's just one thing. The, 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 the fact is that salt uh, by itself uh, is uh, 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 comprised, has their contradictions existing in salt. I mean, this object, this, this specific object, this uh, has uh, everything that is in existence, all matter, uh, is comprised of, uh, of this relationship between positives and negatives. And, and so salt has a, a, an existence of its own. Um, uh, and so uh, the same thing is true of the of the uh, of the uh, the butter uh, or the substitute that you use for that. That's that's butter, and even what went into that was something uh, different. Well, once you put the salt and the butter uh, and the milk uh, uh, and the uh, the uh, the the baking uh, powder and, and what have it that goes into the biscuits, now you don't have you have a relationship that's defined by there's a new relationship that has been born. There's a new product that has been born. Now, what you have uh, with the emergence of, uh, of, uh, of the colonial capitalist uh, mode of production, of the colonial mode of production, uh, you no longer have just a lot of different uh, 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 entities, countries existing in, in some kind of casual relationship to each other. Now it's all one. You got a damn biscuit. You don't just have salt. You don't just have butter. You don't just have uh, 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 baking uh, powder. Uh, uh, you've got one thing. It's a whole new thing. So the salt loses its identity, uh, and the butter loses its identity, and the milk substitute loses its identity in this new thing that is coming to existence. And that's what has happened uh, 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 with the whole world. So it's not like salt has a separate existence from the rest of it anymore, or the butter, or the milk, or the bacon uh, 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 powder that goes into it. There is a new uh, thing altogether. And that's why we say revolution is a process. And looking at uh, uh, society itself, you're looking at processes now. And a new process was born uh, of colonialism. So you have one world economy coming together. You got a biscuit. And uh, I think it's really important for us to understand uh, history in that fashion, unlike the Marxist, uh, unlike the European, unlike the, the colonizer, who still sees the world uh, as, it, uh, as, as, uh, as something that uh, where, it, where the colonizer is the central force and defines the world from the perspective of the salt, as opposed to being able to define the world uh, from the perspective of the biscuit, which has come into existence. So anyway, that's kind of sort of what has happened. And that's one of the problems. And so when, when Cornforth uh, here at the bottom of page 24 says, uh, so long as this mode of production remains in existence, and he's talking about the capitalist mode of production, so long will the streams of wealth and poverty remain, and so long will socialist ideas of justice be opposed by capitalist ideas of justice. Uh, the, the task of socialists, therefore, is to organize and lead the struggle of the working class against the capitalist class to the point where the working class takes power from the capitalist class. Uh, but it's so difficult for this to happen from the Marxist and Cornforce perspective. That's why African internationalist uh, uh, philosophy is so important. That's why we recognize the significance of dialectic and historical materialist investigation and analysis, that they are not the philosophy, they are the method of investigating, unlike what, what uh, uh, Cornforth and many people consider themselves Marxists would say. And if we uh, understand the world uh, this way, uh, then we will understand the ease with which uh, uh, the colonizer can make uh, errors in terms of trying to define the reality. Because uh, I, I use another example because it's something that, uh, that we've been talking about recently in other work that, that I'm doing, and it's particularly now when this whole crisis of the social system is upon us and, and even the, the, the ruling class now is preoccupied with, uh, with uh, trying to uh, deal with this change 
world with the depth of this crisis that everything is up for grabs every idea is being challenged and and so much so that uh, the ruling class is make is increasingly uh involved in trying to suppress any ideas that challenge the prevailing ideas so that you have things like the facebook and other instruments uh we've already experienced uh, the fact that uh you we have uh news uh, organizations new york times and other your local newspaper if it continues to exist refuse to even come to press conferences and generally speaking cover what it is that you're doing because ideas that contend uh with the existing order especially during uh, this era of crisis are prohibited and and the the thing about that is that they're not just uh, uh ideas that uh that uh, revolve around the colonizer and the colonizer though this is the fundamental thing that uh, uh, uh demands suppression from the bourgeoisie uh the fact is the crisis uh of the social system that is that is based on the difficulty the growing difficulty uh, uh, for the uh, colonial capitalists to take resources from the colonized uh, the growing struggles that's being uh, presented to uh, the colonizer uh, being uh, becoming generalized throughout the world so that uh, it's in venezuela it's uh, 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 in uh, uh, nicaragua it's in iran it's in throughout the middle east it's a whole generalized uh, uh, assault on the existing uh, social system uh, itself, and uh, and so when this happens, uh, then it's it, increasingly difficult for the colonizer to extract value from the colonized. It's harder now for them to steal what they were stealing from the Middle East because they got a big contest that's happening with people who are in Syria, with people who are in Afghanistan, with people who are in Iraq and Iran. And then you look at uh, South America where uh, what is considered South America, and, you know, Cuba being uh, considered a part of that, You've had the Cuban Revolution, you have Venezuela, you had Nicaragua, you had uh, Ecuador, you had all these places now challenging the ability of the bourgeoisie to steal. And then you've got internal communism of the United States, uh, where the Mexican people uh, uh, and and not just the Mexican people living uh, on the on the on on this side of the artificial border, but you've got the colonized coming from throughout the Americas crossing that border uh, to objectively speaking, independent of their consciousness of what it is that motivates them. Objectively speaking, uh, 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 coming uh, and and accessing their own resources because whether they know it or not, uh, uh, they're going to places that where wealth is concentrated when they come to the United States. And where does that wealth come from? It comes from the colonized peoples, including the colonized people of the Americas, including from Honduras, including uh, from not Venezuela and Guatemala and all these other places that they've been doing it uh, for centuries. Now the people are, are moving toward this resources and challenging the ability of the colonizer to, to, to uh, maintain uh, uh, this relationship that is had at the expense of all of us. And then you have the emergence of uh, uh, the reemergence in modern history of, uh, of critical forces like China and Russia uh, who are contending uh, with the capitalist, uh, colonial capitalists uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, 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 for resources, for space. Uh, uh, and this deepens the whole crisis of the, of the social system. And when this crisis <laughs> gets deep, the system then uh, turns inward and, and begins to attack the rights of all the people who live among the colonized, and they are affected in different ways. And you see this, this uh, energy, this uh, struggle that happens among the colonizers themselves. January 6th was part of that, where people are talking about Trump and and you know and January 6th and and Trump was obviously involved but it's more than Trump you've got a situation where the majority of the people in the United States are, are believe more white people believe uh, most of what Trump is uh, uh, has said and you've got forces that have been unleashed and they've unleashed in a fashion that don't that that does not uh, give that much uh, significance to the validity of the political uh, uh, structures that uh, that uh, prevail uh, as means by which they can solve their problems. So uh, actions uh, they are being criminalized on the on the right, 
Uh, they have been criminalized on the left. There's uh, efforts being made by, uh, by the system, not just efforts. They are shutting down uh, the right uh, for African people to vote. You've gone through this whole civil rights struggle, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera, where you've got whole states throughout the United States uh, 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 blocking the ability of African people to participate in the electoral process. You've got uh, states in the United States uh, where they are actually uh, now criminalizing protests, uh, and so this is a real serious uh, crisis uh, that that uh, that the capitalist system and colonial capitalist system is experiencing. And so as this happens, then you find a sector of uh, so-called left-wing forces, black and white, uh, but essentially white people saying that the fundamental contradiction is fascism. Let's fight against fascism. And fascism, of course, uh, is uh, something that gets experienced when the uh, uh, the colonial capitalist, the colonizer uh, societies uh, begin to experience some of the kinds of dictatorship that is normal for the colonized. Uh, that what happens to us on a regular basis as colonized people, uh, the murder of African people throughout this country by cops is never characterized by fascism, as fascism. Uh, the uh, brutality that's imposed on on the, on the peoples around the world uh, by uh, colonial capitalism never characterizes fascism. The fact that one out of every eight human beings on earth is in prison, uh, uh, who's in prison is in the United States is not characterized as, as African, is not characterized as fascism. Uh, by the same people who are screaming bloody murder about fascism now. Why are they screaming bloody murder about fascism? Uh, because fascism uh, is something that uh, the colonizer is experiencing, the so-called hidden dictatorship uh, that uh, is considered the norm uh, for capitalist uh, democracy uh, uh, is now uh, raw and naked and wide open the way the dictatorship always prevailed, always obvious uh, for African and colonized people. And it's a dictatorship that the majority of the white people, including the socialists, accept. So they only create the concept of fascism to define uh, that point where the capitalist system begins to act uh, uh, toward the colonizer in the fashion that uh, it acts against uh, the, the colonized, the Africans and others upon whom the whole social system uh, is based. So, uh, uh, and, and this is like a part of the contradiction we're looking at in terms of idealism, uh, how uh, uh, the, 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 the objective is not simply to organize uh, the, 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 the task of socialists, therefore is to organize according to Corn for uh, uh, the struggle of the working class against the capitalist class to the point where the working class takes power from the capitalist class, but you can't do that unless you have a, a real historical materialist uh, understanding of the world and know that the uh, that the all classes uh, of the colonizers both the worker and the uh, uh, and the bourgeoisie are uh, given birth to by colonialism itself it was this so-called uh, primitive accumulation of capitalists as defined by marx it's this primitive accumulation of capital about which marx said uh, that uh, that uh, it has uh, the, the enslavement of African people, the, what they're uh, doing to get this primitive accumulation of capital has the same significance in political economy uh, as original sin in theology. This is the starting point. But none of the people who are talking about fascism start from that perspective. They start from things begin to affect white people in a certain way. And this is when white people enter history with the rise of capitalism. You see white people enter uh, into history, uh, and, but the rise of capitalism comes as a consequence of the assault on Africa, African people, and the rest of us. So I hope I made the point in terms of what it is that we're looking at and why uh, we uh, have this approach of dialectical and historical materialist investigation and, and not become uh, a philosophical idealists ourselves by simply accepting uh, the, uh, the world uh, as it is, as though it's ordinary and normal. People talk about slavery often as a rite of passage, uh, that you just go through this to get to whatever the hell it is that African people are supposed to get to. And usually what we're supposed to get to is acceptance uh, in the uh, slave-based uh, 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 social system itself. But anyway, I hope I did not ex uh, uh, exhaust you uh, with that long 
discourse. Uh, so, uh, and, and, but I am saying something about what the task of the socialist, the task of socialism to be true, of socialists, uh, is to assault uh, the whole uh, uh, system uh, resting upon this foundation to unite with the colonized. That's the, under the leadership of the colonized to overturn the social system because the task of the socialism, of the socialist, is to attack the pedestal upon which the whole social system rests. In fact, Marx at one time said that what he referred to as wage slavery uh, in Europe, which is the white working class uh, in Europe, uh, uh, required uh, slavery pure and simple uh, and what he characterized as a new world. In other words, this is the foundation. This is the basis. This is the thing uh, that made it possible for there to be such a thing as a white, work, a white working class was the enslavement of Africans and other people. Therefore, we understand this and our starting point of our investigation is not when white people or the colonizer have a problem. The starting point of our investigation is the uh, problem that we have as a country consequence of uh, in the process of giving birth to the social system that we are experiencing today. So if we do not understand this, then we cannot find a way to fight effectively for socialism. We shall find that our socialist ideas are constantly disappointed and betrayed. And then he talks about corn for such indeed has been the experience of British socialism, but it's been the experience of socialism altogether. It's been of the, of the oppressor. You got to remember uh, that uh, Nazis in Germany, the fascists that people say uh, is uh, the, the big problem for white people, uh, Nazi was a national socialist uh, uh, party. It was a party of so-called national socialism. And, 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 and uh, the fact is that when we talk about fighting uh, uh, the experience of British socialism, American socialism, French socialism, look at the history. Look at how they've all fought uh, uh, to maintain colonialism, even as they characterize themselves as socialism, socialists fighting for a new world. And that's because uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, were able, because uh, they had kicked us out of the process, us being the colonized, and that we were silenced, we were brutalized, we were garroted, we were killed, we were drowned and otherwise raped out of political significance. And so they had this discussion just among themselves about what was the most important thing in the world. And now the fact is that the colonized, the oppressed, and the African internationalists are uh, emerging, uh, have emerged. We are on the scene. And we are defining the world quite differently. And this is the thing that gives the party uh, significance in terms of being a leading force to overturn the whole colonial capitalist system and organizing African people all around the world. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, Cornforth again, uh, it, uh, he, let's see, uh, it can be seen from uh, these examples how idealism serves as a weapon of reaction and how when socialists embrace idealism, they are, in be in, they are being influenced by the ideology of the capitalists. We agree. And that's most of the white, white left, et cetera. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we've seen some differences. Uh, a comrade who just recently got out of prison, Jan Laman, uh, for example, white guy. Uh, and uh, his treatment uh, in prison, his treatment uh, 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 by the, the colonial capitalist state was quite different from the treatment that we see uh, being in, uh, 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 given to uh, many other white people. Because what Jan has done is cast his lot with the colonized. He's been quite clear about this. He's been quite clear that the fundamental question is African people and what happens to African people. So he gets treated uh, you know like a certain way so he's he's one who is distinguished uh, 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 in the struggle uh, for socialism so uh, I want to uh, we say that we talk about how uh, cornforth it can be seen from these examples how, how, how idealism serves as a weapon of reaction and how when socialists embrace idealism they are being influenced by the ideology of the capitalist. We can no more take over and use capitalist ideas for the purpose of socialist theory than we can take over and use the capitalist state machine with all its institutions and officials for the purpose of building socialism. And we go beyond that, we can say we can no longer, uh, we can no more take the colonialist ideas for the purpose of socialist theory. 
And that's what you have. You have uh, 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 communist colonizers, you have uh, left colonizers, reactionary colonizers, they all uh, rest upon a foundation of colonial domination of Africa, Africans and other oppressed peoples around the world. So I think it's really important for us to, to, to recognize that. I wanna just say uh, right now uh, uh, that uh, I really appreciate the participation uh, in this, uh, in this study and all the studies of our comrades uh, from various places around the world outside uh, of the United States, uh, in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, uh, in Mali, uh, in all over uh, South Africa in particular, uh, all over in Switzerland uh, uh, and various other places that we'll hear more about uh, uh, as this study uh, ends, uh, but also all over Europe, all over the Caribbean. Uh, uh, we uh, really appreciate the participations of our comrades in Bermuda and uh, uh, comrades who uh, uh, in the Bahamas and in Jamaica. Uh, Comrade Janelle Uhuru, uh, one of our leading forces in Jamaica, uh, really appreciate uh, participation uh, from Christel uh, 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 in uh, Guadeloupe uh, and, and all the other uh, comrades who are involved uh, in taking on this struggle. And in fact, uh, your presence uh, and the fact that I'm mentioning you, whether you're in France or and uh, in, in England and and uh, other places in Europe, uh, or whether in fact uh, you're uh, in uh, 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 West Papua, Papua, um, uh, who've just uh, uh, entered uh, into uh, uh, the work. It's the fact that this connection uh, of all of us gives us a full view uh, of uh, of the reality that has to be examined. Uh, this our analysis is based on recognition of the relationship of all these forces, not only that we have to each other, but that we have to the world. And we make a prediction uh, on the future based on our understanding of the relationship we have to the construction of this uh, vicious social system uh, uh, and, and the work that we do to bring it down. So uh, right through history, indeed, idealism has been a weapon of reaction. Whatever fine systems of philosophy have been invented, idealism has been used as a mean of justifying the rule of an exploiting class and deceiving the exploited. And fundamental to this whole question, again, is colonialism. Think about this. Uh, the African People's Socialist Party is the first uh, time in more, uh, than 100, uh, more than 100 years with the uh, advent of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the African Communities League under the leadership of Marcus Garvey. Uh, the first time uh, since then uh, that uh, a movement, a party, an organization that uh, spanned the African world uh, has been pulled together to fight for our liberation, which means that we have escaped uh, from this uh, ongoing problem of fighting uh, for our freedom uh, based on the definition that has been imposed on us at any given location in the world. So we don't fight as Ghanaians, even though we're in Ghana. I want to say Uhuru uh, to comrades in Ghana. We don't fight uh, as Guadalupans, as even though we are there. Uh, we don't fight as some kind of American Negroes uh, because we are there. We are one people scattered all around the world. And it's that attack on Africa and our scattering around the world and the philosophy that's grown out of that, that would include what happens to us in and uh, 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 West Papua, uh, that is the thing that we uh, are fighting against. And we have now a greater capacity uh, to take that on uh, uh, because of what we put together. It's the first time since the Garvey movement. And this makes us fundamental to the feet of the whole colonial capitalist system, the African People's Soldiers Party. When we say that uh, our work and our philosophy uh, make us uh, most uh, uh, prepared uh, 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 to lead. Have, they have prepared us to lead the work, the struggles we've been involved in. It's not a matter of empty braggadocia. It is a recognition of the role that we have played and that there is not going to be uh, any Ghana revolution, Ghana freedom, or any Negro freedom in America or any place else. It's, we were enslaved as a people and we're going to break out of this thing as a people. And that's why Garvey uh, was so impressive and, and fundamental uh, uh, in the struggle that he organized and led and why the African People's Socialist Party is also. So I want to uh, go back uh, quickly to Cornford. He said, this is not to say that truths have not been expressed in ideal, idealist guise. Of course they have. Uh, for idealism has very deep roots in our ways of thinking. And so men often clothe their thoughts and aspirations in idealist dress. 
But the idealist form is always an impediment, a hindrance in the expression of truth, a source of confusion and error. I mean, we look at the remarkable Marcus Garvey, you know, uh, and we see the essential contradiction uh, uh, exposed, expressed by Garvey's uh, slogan of Africa for Africans at home and abroad. That's a really profound statement about uh, what our, our revolutionary movement is about. And then we uh, hear Garvey, uh, you, know, you know, even deepen that uh, 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 by saying, uh, you know, one God, uh, one, what do you say? One uh, uh, God, uh, one, uh, how does that go? Anyway, one, one, one something, one destiny. The point is, even though he used the term God, which is an idealistic expression, it doesn't undermine the basic uh, materialist uh, uh, philosophy that is uh, to be found in African internationalism uh, that Garvey promoted. One, one God, one something, one, uh, one destiny, uh, one something. Again, uh, progressive mo movements in the past have adopted and fought under an idealist theory. But this is shown only that they contain in themselves the seed of future reaction in as much as they represent the striving of a new exploiting class to come to power or that they were themselves influenced by ideas of reaction or that it has been a mark of, weak, of their weakness and immaturity. For example, the great revolutionary movement and then we talk about the English bourgeoisie in the 17th century uh, uh, and fought on the idealist religious slogan, uh, the same appeal that uh, uh, to God uh, justified uh, all kinds of things that were reactionary. So, uh, but I want to go down to page, uh, 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 to page, well, let's say early Democrats in the bottom of page 25, early Democrats and socialists have many idealist notions, but in their case, this demonstrated the immaturity and weakness of the movement. The idealist illusions had to be overcome if the revolutionary working class movement was to arise and triumph. As the movement grew strong and the continuance of within it of idealist notion represented an alien reactionary influence, uh, like fighting against racism. We can truly say that idealism is essentially a conservative force, an ideology helping the defense of things as they are and the preservation of illusions in men's minds about their true condition. On the other hand, every real social advance, every increase in the productive forces, every advance of science generates materialism and is helped along by materialist ideas. As the whole history of human thought has been the history of the fight of materialism against idealism over the overturning of idealist illusions uh, and fantasies. So uh, comrade uh, director Akile, um, where are we? How should we move uh, from here? I know it is 8.03. Uh -huh. Oh uh, yeah, I'm about to say your central time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is it? 9.03, right? No, yeah, it's 9.03, yeah, it's good. Okay, all right. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is good. It's the next subhead, the fight for materialism. So we can pick up back, pick up there. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, so thank you, Chairman. Um, and I just wanted to let you know and our, our attendees know, but um, Zoom did not allow us to go live um, on Facebook or YouTube. So um, we will be uploading this study to uh, Facebook and YouTube right after. Um, we do have party and APSC members on, and um, so we're going to go through the regular program as scheduled um, or as set for ourselves, and, you know, we're still trying to troubleshoot this, but it's something that other users have, other big live streamers are experiencing as well, so um, we're trying to rectify the situation, but just uh, wanted to let you know that, Chairman. Well, I appreciate it because I've been seeing so much, uh, and I spoke to it uh, earlier, not knowing what had happened to us. But the bourgeoisie is not going to contribute to our ability to communicate to each other and to spread these ideas. That's why what we do on the ground is going to be so fundamental. And Malcolm X was absolutely right when he says the white man cannot win a ground war. Uh, you know that. Uh, you know, so uh, cyberspace, uh, he may own that, uh, uh, and we'll struggle in that place as well. Uh, but it's going to be the ground game that makes the difference in terms of uh, who is victorious uh, in this struggle, whether it's going to be revolution or reaction. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, just go into our announcements. I know most of you guys on the call probably know about these already, but um, for those who will be viewing, um, you know, uh, following the study, 
So um, just want to let everybody know, well, first, and I just want to salute the chairman for going through this really profound study on dialectical materialism um, and uh, letting you know that the study is being brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, where we're winning the war of ideas. And for your revolutionary Worldwide Revolutionary News and Analysis, you can visit theburningspear.com. And we encourage everyone watching today, if you are not already subscribed to the Burning Spear newspaper, get a one-year subscription today, 12 issues delivered straight to your door for $25, or the digital edition delivered to your email inbox. Get a combo of both for 20% off, and you can also gift a subscription to comrades and family members and donate to sponsor prisoner to a, a donate for a sponsor prisoner subscription. You can do all of this at theburningspear.com slash subscribe. And give the gift of African internationalism, visit burningspearmarketplace.com for books and literature by Chairman Amalia Shatella and other movement leaders. Check out the pamphlet sections with reissued and vintage pamphlets, including The New Period and Smash Slander, which have been discussed in previous Omali taught me studies, and Report from the Mountain. These are critical African internationalist texts that are still relevant today. Check out the new Thinking About Uhuru hat and stock up on your African flags. Go to burningspearmarketplace.com this holiday season. Calling on spear distributors, if you haven't purchased your bundle of November spears, there's still time to order or restock on the November issue. Get the spear out into your community and go to the burningspearmarketplace.com to make that happen as well. Omali Taught Me airs on Black Power 96 FM radio, a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund with the slogan, not just explaining the world, but changing it. Listen on 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida, or streaming online at blackpower96.org and on the free Black Power 96 mobile app. And everybody on this call um, is a member of the African People's Socialist Party or the African People's Solidarity Committee, but um, watching on Facebook and YouTube, you can, um, to join the party, you can visit apspuhuru.org and fill out our contact form. Save the date, Giving Tuesday for the Black Power Blueprint is a campaign to support African self-determination, raising funds for the Black Power Blueprint's community basketball court in North St. Louis. The campaign runs from November 23rd to December 7th. On Giving Tuesday itself, Tuesday, November 30th, beginning at 7 a.m., tune in for a 24-hour telethon hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Register for the telethon at tinyurl.com slash reparations telethon and donate to this important project at gofundme.com slash community basketball. Come to the first ever One Africa, One Nation holiday marketplace in Philadelphia, Saturday, December 4th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Lucian Blackwell Center in West Philly. This African style marketplace is an economic development project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund and Black Star Industries. Shop from a wide variety of vendors presenting everything from crafts, food, jewelry, and more. Volunteers and vendors are welcome. For more information, visit ahuruflemarket.blogspot.com or call 267-875-3532. Like and follow the Loezi Kinshasa like page on Facebook for more African internationalist political education. Secretary General Loezi Kinshasa does frequent live events such as the War of Ideas series. He includes live sessions done in French. To get alerts of when SG Louise is going live, make sure to like and follow his page today. Uhuru Foods and Pies is hiring for a part-time baker in both Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida. Culinary training is preferred. Join the work to build an independent African economy by baking for black power. To apply, email your resume to oakland.volunteer at uhurufoods.org or mail your resume to 7911 MacArthur Boulevard Oakland, California, 94605, or call 800-578-5157 for more information. Make your legacy a taste of freedom. Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles in both Oakland and Philly are hiring full-time truck drivers and full-time marketing coordinators. If you have driving and furniture lifting skills, social media and print marketing experience, and if you can work Wednesday through Sunday, then this is the perfect job opportunity for you. Um, apply for these positions and contribute your labor and skills to this institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Apply by visiting their website in Oakland, uhurufurniture.blogspot.com, and in Philadelphia, that's uhurufurniturephilly.blogspot.com. 
On Tuesday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern, join Ralph Pointer on What's Happening Blog Talk Radio. Tune in by calling 347-857-3293. Ralph Pointer sits on the Black is Back Coalition Steering Committee and chairs the BIBC's Political Prisoners Working Group and also leads the Lynn Stewart Committee. And continue following the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus, COVID-19. APTUP has an international telehealth program, a free resource for African people to get our COVID-19 related questions and concerns answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Ankh. You can make your free virtual appointment with one of their professional health providers by going to developmentforafrica.org slash telehealth. To keep up with our movement events, visit the burningspear.com's events page and subscribe to our mailing list. And lastly, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Tommy Sunday study. The Burning Spear has reached our goal of 10,000 subscribers. So thank you. And please help us to continue to grow this channel. If you're not subscribed yet, do it now to get notified whenever we go live. And support the Amali Tommy show by donating now at paypal.me slash Amali taught me. So that concludes our announcements, uh, Chairman, and we're going to go ahead and get into questions and answers. So for comrades on the Zoom, please type in your questions into the chat or use a Q&A feature. We do have some questions from last week as well, Chairman. We had two from last week. May uh, I, may yes. I first uh, just uh, remind you uh, that uh, we should put out something uh, to people who couldn't get to us through Facebook and YouTube. We did, yeah. we did need to have an explanation of, of, uh, of how Facebook uh, and whatever, YouTube or whoever, uh, 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 Zoom offering that problem. Because even if we are on next time, people uh, need not to think that, uh, that uh, it's uncertain if we're going to be there from, from week to week. So I think it's going to be important to let people know what happened and perhaps to offer some instruction about how they can move uh, to connect uh, if they, even if they can't find us, you know, like on, on uh, Facebook, you know, Uhuru. Go Uhuru. ahead. Chairman. Yeah. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, and yes, and we did uh, just, we did post initially just to let people know that this is an issue and to, uh, we'll be posting the video, but we'll provide further explanation following. Yeah, um, I, I think that we have to, you know, say more than it's an issue. I, I don't, I think it's not a, just a, some kind of technical problem that we're confronted with and we're gonna to have to let people know, not only, uh, you know, uh, so that uh, people can connect with us, but so that everybody can understand that this is part of the war that you're involved in wherever you're located. This is an issue that the bourgeoisie controls uh, the basic um, uh, means by which we can communicate with each other. And uh, if they were powerful enough to even, uh, you know, uh, uh, take a, a former president of the colonial power off, you know, uh, they are working all the time at us. And, and they're even having Senate hearings and things like that justifying, uh, uh, you know, what they are doing. So please, yeah, I think that's important. We're under attack. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna go take a look at these, these questions from last week. Um, again, we had two and one came from Comrade Diop and uh, his question was, Uhuru, this is very powerful presentation. Can you speak on the role of drugs and alcohol in the question of philosophy in oppressed communi communities? Yeah, I think that's really, uh, uh, really important uh, because in the, without access to uh, 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 materialist uh, uh, worldview, uh, we are so victimized by drugs and alcohol, and it presupposes the use of drugs and alcohol in colonized community presupposes something wrong with us, just like religion does, presupposes something is wrong with us. And uh, instead of attacking the material basis for our oppression exploitation, we end up trying to change our our, our uh, artificially change our views of that by numb, numbing ourselves with booze, uh, uh, with drugs and things like that, so that we, we don't experience them, but they don't go away because we use the drugs and the alcohol. And it's our responsibility as uh, organizers, as revolutionaries to help people come to better uh, understanding of what the hell is really affecting us. And I think to the extent that we change uh, uh, how our community uh, is willing to accept uh, uh, our re 
our reality, I think that we also impact the issue of drugs and alcohol in the community. I've never been uh, um, I've never been satisfied with the fact that uh, I remember, like uh, in in Florida, on my way to the studies we would do every Sunday at the rural house, uh, I would pass a, a, a parking lot, so filled uh, with church parking lots, filled with cars and what have you. And Africans were there to uh, uh, to uh, receive uh, uh, that the drug that they were pumping there in the brains of the people, uh, as opposed to uh, so people are trying to find a way uh, to deal with the oppression exploitation. That as as opposed to attacking uh, the oppression exploitation, they attack themselves. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of affecting how they perceive how they how they experienced it as opposed to uh, overturning it. So uh, I think, uh, Comment Dia, that's, that's what we're looking at, uh, our community being, uh, you know, first robbed of uh, an ability uh, to control our perception uh, of, of the world, uh, having that done by some other force, and then uh, have a perception imposed on us about how we should experience the world or uh, and that is what contributed to contributes to the whole drug and alcohol use uh, uh, that we find uh, among the oppressed all the time. And you see uh, that uh, colonized people who've been severely victimized, successfully victimized uh, by this kind of assault, you see things like alcoholism and drug uh, uh, use uh, uh, happening on a regular basis. And even people who deal with the so-called harmless drugs, uh, like the government suddenly loves us enough uh, that it's offering freedom so everybody can now get high uh, off of off, uh, marijuana and what have you. But the thing is that uh, uh, that all of this uh, you can anticipate comes with a greater exploitation, greater oppression, and the generalized utilization of, uh, of marijuana or any form of drugs uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with that. Uh, it does not serve us. It, it, it is a philosophical idealism placed, uh, given a material um, uh, engine um, through drugs and, 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 and alcohol. Who are the comrades? Who are Dia? Who are Chairman? Thank you. And um, yeah, I want to thank Diop for his question. Um, our next question comes from Comrade Kundai in Huntsville, Alabama, and asked, can you explain why we fight for reparations as an organization rather than for individual families and how this way supports our struggle for liberation more? Yeah, the, the idea is that, uh, that uh, there's a notion, I, I remember when some people finally got involved in the reparation movement, uh, they put out uh, this, this thing, um, well, Imari uh, uh, Obadeli, you know, uh, you know, uh, put out this thing that if you need to get your uh, your your car fixed or your, your teeth fixed or a new car, et cetera, this is why you support reparations. And there is this thing that's being promoted uh, by uh, certain uh, uh, people who uh, stand, put themselves forward as, uh, 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 as uh, pro reparations that somehow it's gonna help individuals. But the fact is that we didn't get in this situation as individuals. The whole African nation was assaulted, and not only as as individuals in terms of uh, individual persons, but the fact is that um, uh, you know the the the, the reparations issue uh, is one that uh, has been confused uh, uh, by uh, I believe uh, agents uh, like intelligence agents who uh, have seen the inevitability of the growth and rise of the reparation demand. Uh, by saying that uh, only Africans who can prove that we were oppressed uh, in the United States or exploited in the United States uh, should get reparations, that somehow uh, uh, other Africans, when the fact is the whole social system, all of the capitalist system together uh, 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 was born off the exploitation of all of Africa and all of African people. And the reality is that if Africans were in the United States uh, being uh, exploited through uh, forced labor, uh, brutal and, and murderous forced labor, uh, we were in the United States uh, doing this because Africans have been kidnapped from Africa and Africa itself was denied the benefit of the labor of the genius that uh, was still stolen from Africa and dispersed all around this world. It's all African. So you don't have, shouldn't have to come up with a birth certificate to prove anything. You don't need Louis Jakes 
Gates Jr., the little uh, sellout lick spittle, uh, to, uh, uh, to justify why we demand reparations, you know. Uh, uh, so I think that, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's ours as collective. We have to see reparations uh, also as a, as a function of the revolution, of taking back our power, because even if Africans got uh, full reparations on tomorrow, uh, uh, in the place where we're located, we still live under white power, which means that anything that we get is going to be taken from us or we'll be oppressed and exploited uh, as a people within a vicious colonial capitalist system uh, that uh, actually uh, is based on uh, expropriation of value from working people, et cetera. So there is no future, no meaningful solution. And the best thing you can get uh, if you uh, see reparations in this way is a new poverty program or, or something to that effect. When our objective is to get a whole new social system uh, by taking back the resources stolen from African African people and applying them uh, to the requirements of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the ability to produce life uh, for Africa and African people. So Kundai, um, I think it's a good question and I hope that uh, we have uh, responded in a way that that is is helpful. Uhuru. The rural chairman, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Comrade Kundai, for your question. <clears throat> so that was it from last week's chairman, and we're going to move to this week's questions. Remember, type them into the chat or the Q and A feature. This uh, question from this week uh, comes from Comrade Sayero in Battle Creek, Michigan. He asked to the chairman, as you were explaining the many political initiatives that the colonizer is implementing today in order to disable our capacity to accomplish productive goals in our communities, what are the differences in the manners or tactical methods they use today, as opposed to the ones 20, 30, or 40 years ago via the media, legislation, and other institutional misleading initiatives as it relates to dialectical materialism? Well, uh, one thing that we know through uh, an, a dialect, dialectical materialist investigation of uh, society is uh, the, the fact that um, uh, the ability of our oppressor to lock us into the situation uh, is based on the establishment, uh, the emergence of this institution called the state. And uh, the state is something that uh, we know has come into existence uh, with the emergence of, uh, of class splits in society. And anytime you see classes, you're talking about class splits in society. And uh, where a, a sector of the society live at the expense of the vast majority of the other people, and nobody's going to tolerate that uh, uh, willingly. And so uh, uh, there emerges this institution called a state, which is uh, organized and bureaucratic uh, uh, a form of coercion uh, that controls police, that controls military forces and education and all these other things. Uh, uh, and they protect the existing social system. So we uh, people get taught. And, and when you see uh, things like the bourgeois media, it's called bourgeois media for a reason, because it is uh, uh, a servant of the existing uh, social system. So uh, uh, the fact is that that's always been used against us. There's never been a time, and, and you know they may become more effective uh, from time to time. Uh, for example, I remember how uh, in the early 1960s, uh, we were able to pick up a newspaper and read uh, some struggle that was happening in some place else in the world or uh, or in the United States by African people and, and, be, and, and be able to learn from that and apply those lessons to where we were locally. And then I remember this fierce uh, development of, of where the uh, bourgeois media began to uh, uh, characterize itself as having to defend uh, uh, itself from manipulation by the media from the black movement. And so they would stop publishing uh, information that uh, allowed us to learn from each other using uh, their mediums. And uh, that happened in the real world. I mean, that is something that you can, uh, people who do this kind of research can investigate and, 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 and can you know, see uh, the emergence of that as a means of uh, curtailing or limiting uh, the outreach. So the bourgeoisie has determined some time ago that we were not going to be able uh, to use its uh, 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 mechanism, its vehicle uh, for, uh, for fighting uh, for freedom. And uh, so uh, 
they've always done that. And uh, what has always been true, however, is that their, their effectiveness has been limited. And the significance of the effectiveness uh, has also to do with the class contradictions inside the African community, because there's a sector of our, of our people, our community, the African petty bourgeoisie, uh, who has been trained uh, to uh, believe uh, uh, everything. And they, they become uh, vehicles, instruments through which they uh, the imperialists or the colonial capitalists uh, spread their philosophy and, and uh, their influence within our community. That's always been the case. And uh, so uh, the fact is that today, uh, African working class has its own revolutionary party uh, that is dedicated to uh, spreading African internationalists in an entirely different uh, understanding of the world and organization on the ground throughout the African world. And uh, this is a profoundly uh, important difference. And we recognize that the process of doing this in terms of dialectical materialism is not to fight the shadows because the, the, the bourgeois, the colonial state legalizes itself because some people get trapped in this whole question about what's legal and what's illegal, uh, which is uh, significant only as it informs us of how we have to move uh, within, within the existing social system and against the existing social system. So, uh, 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 the fact is that we uh, are building a, a revolutionary uh, organization uh, on the ground, the African working class is, and that we start uh, in 2000, today we start organizing not to try to uh, make it better uh, for us under uh, in, uh, uh, a colonial uh, power, but to uh, eradicate colonial power itself and putting that that power in the hands of the people in the various communities and units and, and local uh, party organizations and regions that we are creating every place. That's part of uh, taking the power. And that's the thing, ultimately, that would make it impossible uh, uh, to destroy a movement. You got to remember that in every era, every period, uh, the colonizer uh, uh, has the advantage in, in terms of uh, communication capacity, in terms of uh, of, of, uh, of uh, media uh, control, et cetera. I remember a story told about uh, the Vietnamese and how the people, once they understand what the objectives are, what they're fighting for, uh, can overcome these kinds of obstacles because sometimes we can be overwhelmed with what, we, what appears to be the technological strength and power of the oppressor. Uh, but the Vietnamese just offered splendid examples of of creating our own media. And I remember reading how uh, uh, living in South Vietnam under uh, this uh, colonial dictatorship imposed on the people by the United States government where a people's movement was uh, uh, curtailed in a very serious way. Uh, uh, and they could not uh, put forth their newspapers and things like that on the street that in the middle of the night, uh, uh, revolutionaries would take uh, flyers and take them to the top of buildings and they would wet the flyers down uh, to hold them on, 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 on the rooftops. And, and what would happen is that the sun would come out and they'd dry the flyers off and then they would flutter all over uh, the communities that they wanted to uh, put the propaganda out to. So people have always found a way to get around this. And the fact is that they need revolutionary organization like the Vietnamese had revolutionary organizations uh, that is committed to winning this struggle and winning our liberation and, and uh, 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 exercising the genius of the masses. And the genius of the masses is there. It has to be there. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to survive off of, of uh, how colonialism dominates uh, uh, almost every aspect of our life. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, comment, uh, Sariero, uh, hopefully that uh, was a meaningful response. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman um, and uh, Comrade Sayero says, thank you for this explanation of the state and how it represents self-protection through escalated initiatives for it. The state, just as the state did us today in the initiative to broadcast on their instruments, Facebook and YouTube, et cetera. I also agree with the chairman that in war, there are no conventional manners of fighting. It is war on all Africans by this damned oppressor. So Uhuru Sayero. Uh, Sayero, yeah. <laughs> So our next question comes from Comrade Kalambayi in St. Louis. Um, she asks, Zahur Chairman, I really appreciate this study. I wanted to ask a question. There are people who are wanting to understand during this time of colonialism, 
we can see imperialism falling and the people are wanting to know what to do with the process of empty shelves and homelessness. Well, I think what we're talking about is empty shelves because uh, it's really uh, significant to see, uh, uh, you know, they attributed to the uh, supply uh, chain um, uh, disruption of uh, how uh, increasingly uh, in the United States that used to brag about the difference in uh, in capitalism and how you would see full shelves of food and things like that and resources as compared to what they were then talking about communist Russia and other places that there were empty shelves and lines of people trying to get resources and increasingly we see that kind of thing happening uh, in the US and Europe and, and, and various other uh, uh, colonial uh, capitalist countries. And of course, the difference uh, then uh, was that uh, the economic uh, uh, encirclement, isolation uh, of, uh, of, of Russia and, and, and various other uh, countries that, uh, that were characterized as communist, uh, they, it denied them access to uh, the resources from the colonized peoples of the world. The reason that the shells were filled uh, in the United States uh, was because uh, the United States and, and Europe uh, had access to colonial loot uh, resources coming from all over the world, uh, from Africa, from the Americas, uh, from the uh, near slave labor of African people also in the domestic colonies. And, uh, and I've said a long time ago that uh, you get a view of what uh, the, 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 uh, how the victory of, uh, of the colonized will unfold in these uh, colonial countries is when you look at what happened uh, with, uh, uh, within uh, Russia and much of the e uh, Eastern Europe uh, after the US uh, isolated uh, them and the other imperial powers so that did, they didn't have access, they couldn't get uh, the bananas uh, coming from what was characterized as the banana republics in the, in the Americas. The fact is that in the United States uh, and, and, and much of Europe, uh, you can be, been able to go to a supermarket and buy stuff that was out of season, food that was out of season, fruits and vegetables, that, because they were coming from all over the colonized world because they, they had access to colonies and, and, and so-called communist Russia did not have access to com, uh, that. So uh, I just think it's important for us to understand that and also understand how fragile uh, this uh, rule of colonial capitalism is. Uh, because the only thing that makes a difference, uh, has made a difference, is the ability of the colonial capitalists to steal everything. Uh, but African people uh, have been scattered all around the world. And with growing organization and revolutionary theory, uh, then we unite, we, we can shut down by uh, the work that we do in various parts of the world. The so called supply chain is uh, disrupted. But uh, what we have on the one hand is that kind of thing occurring. On the other hand, we have wherever the party uh, and African internationalism prevails is uh, we turn to each other and turn inward and begun the productive process that does not uh, contribute to the development of Europe, but contrib contributes to the development of Africa and African people. So even in the United States, what we've done is we've creating uh, uh, these uh, African uh, uh, marketplaces and uh, 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 where in so-called food deserts, we've initiated uh, uh, markets where African people can come uh, and sell and buy food uh, from each other, keep money's resources circulating in the community, and make it unnecessary for people to try to travel uh, all across uh, towns uh, to just to get a fresh food, make it possible for people to get fresh food uh, uh, where, uh, uh, where in the past they might try to live off potato chips and other junk foods. Uh, uh, and, and that's the struggle. We do that in the process of doing that, not just in the United States, we do that in Africa. We, we initiate that kind of process in various uh, provinces in South Africa as well. Uh, uh, to the extent that we do that, we may negate the influence and authority of the bourgeoisie. And you got to remember um, that, uh, that it was not that, that simple and easy for African people to fall into the economic grasp of uh, colonialism, uh, the fact is that as long as African people could feed ourselves, uh, could grow our own food, uh, then the colonial system, the capitalist system couldn't work. And so in different places in the world, including South Africa, you, you saw, uh, because Africans wouldn't work for the colonizers. And so they used the power of the state that we just talked about before, and a colonial state, 
And then they would tax an African in Africa. And the only way you could pay the taxes to have money, and the only way you can have money was to work for the white man who would give you the money uh, so that you could pay the taxes. And in the process of doing that, they also eliminated or liquidated the ability for African feed, clothing, and house ourselves. And you look at even the United Nations and this wonderful uh, institution, if you would believe them, <clears throat> uh, and how uh, they contribute to uh, undermining uh, uh, the ability of Africa to feed itself. They, they live, you have this whole colonial extraction of value of wealth and all of our resources and, and uh, various uh, proxy wars being fought to, to crush down uh, our capacities. And then they send these uh, uh, trucks uh, with, uh, adorned with blue helmet wearing uh, people who throw um, bags of bleach uh, flour and things like that off truck to starving African masses, undermining even the ability to produce for ourselves. So the fact is, Kamek uh, Kalambayi, I just want to say that, um, that uh, the struggle, this helps us to really understand that we are struggling against colonialism and that uh, we move in a way that negate the economic uh, uh, influence of the colonizer in our communities. We create uh, economic institutions as small as they may be uh, as a part of a process of uh, an incipient independent economic uh, uh, capacity by African people. We've done that and are doing that in the African People's Social Party and the Huru Movement. That's, that's the meaning of everything that we do. Uh, the work under the leadership of Comrade Deputy Chair, uh, 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 owners in Asia tell the 52 economic institutions that we have, the uh, markets and the furniture stores and things like this is a part of incipient uh, uh, independent economic uh, uh, capacity by Africa and African people. The, 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 uh, uh, the uh, garment factory that we uh, uh, moving toward uh, uh, developing uh, in, in Southern and Western West Africa. These are part of the process. This is ours. This belongs to Africa and African people. And to the extent that this stuff is successful, then the economic uh, influence and capacity of the capitalist, uh, uh, those are in, uh, unsuccessful. And what we've understood in the party for a long time is that politics is simply concentrated economics. And so the politics of the party is an anti-colonial politics. And uh, the economic entities that we create contributed to African people being able to control our political life, our economic life altogether. So Uhuru Kamek Kalambayi, I hope uh, uh, that was helpful. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, and thank you, uh, Kulumbai, the President of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, um, for your question. And Kulumbai says thank you in the chat. Uhuru. Well, Comrade Kulumbai, I know the reason you asked the question is because you just wanted us to talk about it for the benefit of people who are not in that party and in the Uhuru Movement, to just give them a better understanding of the work that we do that we're not just trying to become uh, merchants, you know, uh, uh, as such, uh, but it's part of a, a whole overall process of Af Africa capturing our capacity to produce life for ourselves. And the thing that intervenes in our life to make that uh, impossible is colonial capitalism, uh, a social system that ex uh, its existence, uh, a very existence. There's no way you can moderate uh, the uh, the impact that colonial capitalism, colonialism has on the lives of African people. Its existence is, is blood sucking, stealing our resources and what have you. So what we begin to do is that it, at, a, at a given moment, uh, we don't have like armies and things like that at our uh, access that we can send across borders and, and stop them from doing that. Or we don't uh, have the ability, and only have that strategic objective uh, to blow up power stations, et cetera. We see that the so-called supply chain can be disrupted uh, just by Africans not, not participating in it in the best possible way. And we see that uh, even as the supply chain, the chain uh, uh, is uh, disrupted, uh, what we've said all along uh, is that, uh, that uh, Africa and, 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 and what we represent is the, is the, is the weak link uh, in the in, in the colonial capitalist supply uh, chain, uh, and we busted up by just uh, this initiation of a self-serving, uh, independent, uh, self-conscious uh, 
revolutionary uh, economic activity uh, that negates the influence of the colonizer, makes it difficult for the colonizer. And then we do other things to keep the colonizer out as well. I mean, Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, thank you so much. And um, thank you again, uh, President Columbai. Oh. I just want to say, Comrade Columbai, you know. Uh, that one of the things that we contend with all the time is neocolonial forces in our own community, these Negro elected officials that facilitate it, they do everything they can. They'll remove to try to eliminate or liquidate the colonized influence of stealing our properties and things like that in communities where we live. And then they are servants of the big developers and and uh, of the uh, of the, the people who uh, are grabbing uh, our, our our resources in the various communities, and they facilitate that. They 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 help with laws and things like that to make that happen. So it's a it's a comprehensive struggle that we're involved in. And when we say that uh, politics is simply concentrated economics, the the big problem is that the neocolonialists. Uh, and uh, Africans don't don't have uh, economic life, and the neo-colonialists uh, have hitched their wagons to uh, the colonial capitalists, and that's the economics they are connected to. And what we are winning people uh, to uh, is a, a politic that recognizes the absolute need of, uh, for African people to be self-determining, and and this is the economics that we are fighting for. So even if it's not here completely at this moment, we show the vision of the economic power uh, that the African community can have, not as individuals, but as a people. That's absolutely necessary for us to be free and uh, in control of our lives. And so our children can have a future. That's that's what it's about. And I appreciate that uh, that question, that intervention, uh, Comrade Kalambayi. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Um... So we have uh, at least one more question, unless comrades are still typing away. But this question comes from Comrade Timba in St. Louis. And he asks, oh, and he says, her chairman, excellent study. My question is, can you deepen the point that Marx's understanding and research was solving problems for European society and development and what that means for Africans and the development of Africa? Uh, thank you for that question, Comrade uh, Timba. And I know you asked that question in the spirit of uh, an African internationalist, not uh, somebody who's just trying to bash Marxism or Marx or to say, you know, that the white man's philosophy don't serve us because he's white and we are not. Uh, but it's a really uh, important uh, uh, issue that you uh, are raising um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I'm trying to get uh, to take another look at exactly how you phrase uh, that uh, um, that you uh, raised uh, in terms of uh, how this is this is important because uh, some people who call themselves Marxists and who call themselves uh, uh, historical materialists uh, can't get beyond Marx, and so you have. Uh, when we view it as an example, a difference in a materialist and an idealist uh, is that an idealist, uh, of, of, a materialist uh, uh, comes to understand the world and try to understand the world by investigation of the world itself. That's the thing that informs us. That's the thing with, from which we draw conclusions. And, and dialectical and historical materialism are important uh, to us for investigating the world. You don't need dialectical materialism if it's not a tool for investigating the world. And so what, what many so-called Marxists have done uh, is abdicate the responsibility to investigate the world and they act just like Christians. Christians try to solve problems not investigating the world by investigating the Bible. So you might understand a hell of a lot about the Bible, but you know nothing about the world. And so Africans have to understand the world because we live in it. We ex uh, experience it in a particular uh, 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 grotesque way. Uh, and and uh, African internationalism forces us to study uh, this world just as it is. And so if Marx has can come to certain kinds of conclusions and our utilization of the uh, uh, method of investigation and analysis that's called uh, uh, dialectical historical materialism takes us to another conclusion, then that's what we work with. We don't say that we can't say that's true because Marx said it was another thing. One. Two, I think it's really important. I mean, so we don't deify, you know, uh, uh, anybody, Marx or anybody else, so, which is a form of idealism that Marx and uh, 
uh, uh, you know, himself uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, really uh, opposed to. And the other thing is this, that philosophy uh, in the real world is born uh, out of a need for society to explain itself. And at different times, um, this, this, this study has shown us that European society uh, uh, lived under uh, uh, feudal uh, philosophies, specifically coming from the Catholic Church and what have you, divine rights of kings, et cetera. But, it, but uh, moving forward, after they started looting the world, uh, enslaving African people, uh, this whole feudal society was had to dis disintegrate. It couldn't, it couldn't uh, serve the needs of uh, the social system. And in the wake of this disintegration, uh, in the wake of, uh, of the growth of another of other social forces who were becoming richer, even more richer than richer uh, than the nobility, uh, than the kings and queens and things. In the wake of this, uh, then uh, 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 you see the emergence of new new forces challenging the old force, the old system, and the, you see. Uh, a, a, a new a way in which Europe begins to acquire its existence, its life, uh, 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 not by this, this by ripping off uh, uh, peasants and, and uh, uh, in Europe, not by uh, that, uh, but uh, by ripping off the rest of the world and all this tremendous wealth coming now to Europe. And now Europeans are describing what is happening to them. They need to come, they need to have, they have to have a different philosophical outlook. And there were uh, you know, different forces offering up a new world view. And uh, you know, some of them were anarchists, uh, nihilists, uh, uh, and Marx was one of the number of socialists, different kinds of socialists, even Charles Dickens with uh, his, um, uh, what's it called? Christmas Carol, who uh, painted the picture of uh, Scrooge, the, uh, the unrepentant, uh, uh, vicious uh, uh, kind of capitalist who exploited even his crippled relatives and things like that. Uh, uh, and he was a utopian socialist who assumed that uh, going through you know, the Christmas past and the Christmas now and the Christmas future, and Scrooge uh, transforming himself and becoming a good capitalist, and which is where you know many of the democratic socialists uh, uh, exist, and uh, even the Negroes who don't call themselves uh, uh, sometimes they don't call themselves democratic socialists, but they don't offer up any revolutionary uh, objectives. They they play that role uh, as well, and so you have these new forces and uh, a, a philosophical uh, 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 expressions and. I say Marx was one, but uh, who's challenging the whole uh, uh, critique of capitalism as it emerges in a very vicious way uh, in, in European society, but there were others as well. And uh, the point that I'm making is that uh, Marxism as a philosophical expression uh, was not just something uh, that was just a smart white guy decided to go ahead and, uh, uh, and create. It was uh, an attempt to explain the world as it was unfolding uh, uh, with the, the emergence of a whole new social system. That's what we do. And the, the fact is that the, uh, you see uh, the limitations of the existing social system uh, being exposed in a very state. It's what part of what we call a crisis. It can't go any place. And we've mentioned earlier, even in this popular culture, uh, you see uh, a certain kind of nostalgia for the past when imperialism was strong uh, and uh, and in the popular culture, you have superheroes and things like that. Uh, looking back at the past is what it's really doing, uh, even if it's projecting it uh, somehow. And then, of course, when it tries to look at the future, you got dead people, zombies, vampires, walking dead, living dead, uh, et cetera, uh, because it's run into certain kinds of limitations and can't explain the world. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, but increasingly, certain aspects of the reality inside the United States is creeping up, you cannot replace us kind of politic. And that's the significance of the struggle against colonialism because the white people, white power, when I say white people, I'm talking about the, the ideological concept even of white people owes its existence to the emergence of capitalism uh, 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 through uh, the advent of the colonial world economy. And, and so now, uh, uh, the African People's Socialist Party and African internationalism 
is uh, providing uh, an explanation for the world as it is, as it really is, and it it makes a prediction of the future and what that world is going to be like. And we've created the organization and institutional capacity to pursue that future. And we've taken on most of the outstanding ideological, philosophical, and political questions that plagued our, our revolutionary movement since the defeat of the Black uh, Revolution of the 1960s. And for the first time uh, in more than 100 years since uh, Marcus Garvey's incredible Universal Negro Improvement Associations and African Communities League, uh, there is a revolutionary party uh, that has a worldview that encompasses the world, that uh, now there is such a thing as an African liberation movement as opposed to uh, liberation movements happening in Africa or by Africans in various other places around the world. It's a single revolutionary project. And uh, so uh, anyway, Comrade Timber, I don't know if I've diverged uh, too uh, far from uh, the question that you uh, just raised, but uh, that's how I would approach it. And I think it's really important uh, for us to understand Africans have to have the ability to see ourselves as who we are. And it's, it's central to uh, the universe when it comes to the struggle against capitalism, that the way forward, uh, the road to socialism, we've always said is painted black. And it's painted black uh, because uh, the uh, oppression and exploitation of African, African people has been um, absolutely necessary and critical for the emergence and the continuing existence of the colonial capitalist social system. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Timber, for that question. Um, um, okay, yeah, thank you, Timba, for that question. And we do have one more question that came in from Comrade Matum, Chairman. Um, Matum is located in Philly, and he asks, uh, do you think today's communication disconnect today is part due to the defeat of the colonial military in Afghanistan that put a real damper on their military celebration and are afraid that this study would embarrass them even more at a time when the colonial industrial military machine is suffering defeat? I think that... When you look at what has happened in Afghanistan, uh, it will be seen uh, in the future as a major development and uh, an indicator of the uh, loss of capacity and even prestige uh, by US imperialism. It's something that has been happening over a period of time up to now, but Afghanistan, after 20 years, the US having to get the hell out of there with the tail between the legs, even though they are after having left and have not been able to secure the military defeat that they wanted there, we can have our in Afghanistan even today with bombings and terrorist activities that they attribute uh, uh, to uh, internal fighting or they attribute to sectarian fighting between different Muslim groups. It's the United States and it's very Southern and Israel uh, who are trying to disrupt the capacity of the uh, Afghan people to have uh, their own uh, self-determination and their own government. So, but I wanted to say that, and they, of course, they're stealing the Afghan money. They won't even release money that's owed to Afghan uh, Afghanistan until they say the Taliban, uh, who represents the Afghan people, uh, uh, through the movement that they were involved in, struggle. They took the power from the United States. They seeing until uh, Afghanistan proves or uh, promises it's going to treat women right and do all these other kinds of things. And, you know, at the same time, they're saying this, the New York Times today, you know, shows uh, uh, evidence of how the United States government uh, killed something like more than 50 people in Syria, dropping, you know, uh, bombs and what have you on innocent people. And of course, in Afghanistan, the United States government that's talking about the Taliban doesn't treat women right has bombed women, bombed weddings, bombed funerals, bombed all this other stuff, but they're stealing the people's money. And so they're doing, making every effort they can to make sure that the uh, people of Afghanistan cannot be self-governing. It's a real, real guard fight that they're involved in trying to maintain the status quo. So I don't want to uh, understate the significance of the loss uh, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, but I would say uh, that what happened in Afghanistan is just uh, part of an overwhelming uh, loss of capacity, prestige, influence uh, that uh, US and other imperialist forces uh, have been experiencing for a while now, and it's deepening this crisis. And uh, the crisis, uh, you know, we talk about loss in Afghanistan, but we talk about, look at January 6th, that this crisis is making itself manifest in, in, in May 26, uh, uh, 2000, I think it was 20, 
after the murder of George Floyd, you know, thousands of people, millions of people actually involved in protests and demonstrations inside the United States, more than 60 countries outside the United States. So the, the whole system is, is definitely in trouble. The, the issue, though, for us is uh, the revolutionary capacity, uh, revolutionary organization building, as I mentioned earlier, on the ground, having units and local party organizations that uh, make the regional work and leadership that we have meaningful, uh, make anything that I say meaningful because it's resting on a real foundation of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, of an actual revolutionary capacity. So. I hope, uh, Matun, uh, that uh, I address that uh, somewhat. Uh, but you know, uh, that's my response, and that, that they they are fighting a rear guard area when they are trying to uh, frustrate the ability. It's a crisis. They, when I was younger, the U.S. government used to brag about how you you know in this you know let everybody have free speech, you know, because. Uh, you know, there must be this ideas, free expression. They don't believe in that stuff. And then when, they, when it looks like this thing is in trouble, they can say that when they got the world locked up, uh, when you're supposed to have free speech, but they shoot you if you say anything, but there's apparent uh, 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 when they're in control. At the moment, this thing is coming apart like it is coming apart now, forget free speech. Uh, you don't have, they don't even act like you have the right to free speech. They talk about the internet as something that's used that radicalizes people. Like there's some mysterious, mysterious rays that emit, emit from your computer uh, when you uh, uh, go to social media that is going to radicalize you. This is the most nonsensical stuff. Uh, but uh, if people uh, are not, uh, uh, they don't have access to a dialect and historical materialist worldview, uh, they can be made uh, influenced by that kind of stuff, but we'll win it on the ground, Comrade Matum. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, as the Afghan people did. They won it yeah, on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Uhuru. yeah. Um, so we actually have one more question, and we have like four minutes left. Um, Comrade Chimaranga uh, asks Can you speak on the importance of translating African internationalist philosophy into African languages for the African masses and? old people as we grow in the world and, mm. yeah. and old people and old people <laughs> <laughs> well come at Timmering, it is important in terms of translating african internationalist um philosophy in african languages uh that's something that we worked on minimally i think that um that there are a couple of really important uh, pieces that introduce the introduces the, is the basis for the founding of the African Socialist International. I think it's been done uh, in Zulu and 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 uh, perhaps a couple of other uh, language in Southern Africa. I'm not sure if it's been done uh, in um, in uh, Swahili uh, yet, but I I know that uh, Kamet. Secretary General of uh, Louisiana from the African Social International is uh, working with other comrades, uh, making this kind of thing happen. It is important. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah, Chairman, especially as you mentioned, all the places that are, you know, tuned into the Sunday studies and where the party is growing, including in Papua. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be a really important task um, that uh, Adjaprop especially we'll have to, you know, assume in a greater way <clears throat> going forward. But uh, yeah, Chairman, so that brings us to the end. I just want to know, uh, turn it over to you for any closing remarks before we uh, cl get closed out. I just want to really call on, on our brothers and sisters and comrades uh, to, to read uh, this document and to read uh, the stuff we work. Go and find also dialectic of, of a uh, Black Revolution and, and the various political reports that I presented, all of them uh, uh, based on an African internationalist assessment. And I think they'll be much easier for you uh, to read if you had any problems grappling with it in the past. This study will help. Just want to thank everybody for being here and that we have to build a party. Look forward to the upcoming uh, weeks. Uh, you'll see further evidence of how uh, we uh, are growing and consolidating our capacity. Uh, and requiring a deeper, a better uh, kind of organizational uh, relationship within our movement and our party. Uhuru, thank you so very, very much, comrades. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Well, I just really want to salute your leadership 
and appreciate you taking us through uh, dialectical materialism, which is you're explaining deepening the theory of African internationalism for uh, you know everyone in, involved in this process. And I just want to um, express appreciation for all of you for being on your patience in this whole process as we you know continue to you know resolve this era and making sure that more than anything, African internationalism is accessible um, to our people. So um, you know we're going to have any idea of any where people are can we tell that from what we're... oh well it's all in zoom isn't it so it's yeah, nobody you can't say okay yeah over there. yeah um so yeah but we will get this posted up um for following this study we'll get it on uh, facebook and youtube so that uh, the rest of the usual viewers have the benefit of this study um but again just wanted to to let you guys to let you guys know that and appreciate you for being on with us. Um, and yeah, so we'll catch you next Sunday for Amali Taught Me and make sure you support the Amali Taught Me show by donating to paypal.me slash Amali Taught Me. Uhuru, comrades. Thank you. Uhuru. Uhuru. Vanguard up. Vanguard up. Uhuru. <laughs>